as we continue this series on praying and praying deeper, we're going to look at Paul's prayer and we're going to discover this prayer. And you can find it in your Bible in Ephesians chapter 1 if you want to turn there. If you're using a Bible that's in the chair, it's on page 1076. We'll be there in just a little bit. But we'll discover in this prayer how to discover or how to pray for ourselves to discover and our church to discover more about our God. Um, the Christianity begins in a person's life, your life, my life, uh, when man, woman, boy, girl, when we discover, we, we come to this realization that I'm a sinner. I wish I, wish I could change that, but nothing that I found seems to work. You know, how many of you have made on, you know, New Year's Eve, you make those New Year's resolutions, you know? And, and I know you do because the first, the second day of the year, you drive by the YMCA and the parking lot is slam packed. Because my New Year's resolution, I, resolution I'm not going to ask how many have asked this or said this, is this year, I'm going to lose weight. You know, so they start out, you know, the first day of the year, and they're working really hard at it. And, and by the middle of February, it's back down to 50% full in the parking lot. People have given up. We try everything that we can to, to change things in our lives, but nothing seems to work. And then, then we become open to the life-changing good news, the gospel, that tells us Jesus died on a cross to transform us from being hopeless in our sin, and he wants, us to, wants to give us freedom from that old nature. And the moment we believe, here, please hear me, the moment we believe and accept Jesus Christ as our Savior by faith, listen to me, everything changes. Massive change. It's like, like a tsunami sweeps over us and the tsunami of grace and the tsunami of change sweeps over us. And that change is immediately initiated. The Bible calls it a new birth. And you may not have realized it at the time. We talked earlier this year, we did a series on the Holy Spirit, but you may not have realized it at the time, but the Holy Spirit comes in to your life at that very moment and sets up his residence in you. You become his sanctuary. This building, this room is not a sanctuary. We are his sanctuary, right? This room is nothing but a room until we show up and the Holy Spirit is here with us. God is present with us, um, in us, and that's what makes this time together on Sunday morning so special because a whole bunch of people possessing the Holy Spirit come together to worship God. He begins to move in and he begins to, one of the things he does is he begins to clean house. And from the inside out, he cleans and he removes all the wrong behaviors and the habits and self-image. And, and he, he cleans all these things up and replaces those things with Christ. And he begins, because it's a it's a moment by moment, day by day transformation. You may not see it all of a sudden, but sometimes it's just a gradual thing that's taking place. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever found that you wrestle, and maybe even sometimes even resist those changes that God is bringing into you and into your life? You ever found that you wrestle with those things, that you resist those things? I do. The Bible has a hashtag, if you're taking notes, for that process of change, and it's called sanctification. Sanctification. It's the middle part of a three-part salvation that you and I have as Christians. And all three come to you and me as a package with your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, um, we only get justification, which is the first one. It's not like that's all we get. We get this package. The first one is justification. Justification is instantaneous. It happens the moment you believe in Jesus. Boom. I accept Jesus as my Savior. Jesus Christ, I believe you're the Savior. I'm a sinner. I need you. I receive you as my Savior. And at that moment, you may not feel a thing. It's not a feeling. But at that moment, God pronounces you not guilty of all your sin. He grants you forgiveness. He gives you reconciliation with him. And he guarantees you his everlasting life. Paul wrote in Galatians 2, verse 16. He said, we know that no one is justified by the works of the law. In other words, even if you were able to keep the Ten Commandments, that doesn't justify you. 
right? Because you're not able to do that. That's the second part of that. Doesn't matter how good you are, how good of a Boy Scout you are, doesn't matter. You cannot justify yourself by your deeds. He says, but it's by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first part of our three-part salvation. The third part is what is called glorification. And glorification is not something that you and I experience until we die. And when we die, we immediately, at that very moment that our heart stops beating, we stop breathing, our brains cease to make waves. The very moment that we are dead, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, to be absent from the body is to be where? Present with the Lord. That's glorification. It's the change from living life here and now in this body, in these circumstances, to being like Jesus because, as John said, we'll see him face to face. Now, none of us are there yet. We're not living glorification yet. We haven't experienced that yet. And some of us might today. Could be true, right? We don't know when we're going to die. But that's going to happen when we face death. First John chapter 3, verse 2 says, We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. We'll be like him, glorified. That's glorification. That's the third part of our salvation. The second part in the middle, in, the, in between the sandwich there, in the middle of the sandwich is sanctification. If you are a Christian, sanctification is what is happening to you right now. Every Christian at this moment that's taking place. And here's where every Christian is. If you're a Christian here today in this room, this is where you exist today in the process, this three-part process of salvation. You've been justified. Your home is eternal in heaven already. God promises you that. You're going to be in heaven. He promises you glorification. Right now, he's sanctifying you. It's where we are right now. And it's a process that starts the moment that you're justified and lasts as long as you live. There's no retirement from this process of salvation. Well, there is, and if you want it, it's when you die, right? Other than that, it continues on as long as you live. It is, listen to me, it is the sometimes immediate, sometimes gradual changing of the behaviors from my old fallen nature, who I was before I knew Christ, to the new nature with the new desires and behaviors and habits that I begin to live as a Christian. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Paul says, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. Let's get the stuff out of our lives Let's turn away from it. The Bible calls that repenting. Let's get rid of that stuff. Let's turn away from those things that defile our body or spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. Now, it says we work toward it. We cannot work toward it or on our own. It's an act of grace. It's something that we do in cooperation with the Holy Spirit as he brings these things about in our lives. And we begin to leave behind and, and even... In some regards, and some of you could give testimony to this, we even begin to despise our old way of life and we seek out the abundant life that Jesus says is ours. And this is our goal, Christian. It's the goal of every Christian to be holy and conformed, Romans 8 says, to the image of Christ. It raises a question to me about this whole process of change from the time, for me, I was 10 years old until the day I die, the sanctification it raises a question to me is, uh, why are some things changed immediately? Because some of you could say, man, the moment I accepted Christ, things there are some things I stopped doing at that moment. Praise God. I, I've heard stories of drug addicts. I mean, hardcore drug addicts who accept Jesus as Savior and never take another pill or take another shot. Never. From that moment on. You say, is that possible? That's impossible. Well, it's, it's a God thing. You know, and with God, all things are possible. Right? Why are some things gradually changed? And sometimes it's because, I think maybe because we honestly don't know at first. I see this more and more in the generation that's coming up that has never been in church, never known the word of God. Some things are behaviors that maybe we don't at the moment know don't belong in the life of a Christian. 
Cultural morals are constantly changing, aren't they? And, and, and I know in our country, gravitating away from the biblical morals that our nation was built upon. And so things that the Bible pronounces as, oh, those are old nature things. Those are sinful behaviors are, are now viewed predominantly, it seems, in our culture, in our society as, as being okay and acceptable and, and even right. Um, I've, let me give you an example. I've talked with so many couples, mostly young pu- couples, who I know have heard and believed the gospel, but have never heard, never been taught, never seen in the Bible that God's will is for them to be married, not simply to live together. They go, what? I didn't know that. No one ever told them that. And I believe, because I have a lot of faith in our young people, I believe that that, uh, our young adults would rather know the truth than live in ignorance. That's what I'm hearing. This young generation that has, by and large, left the church is saying to the church, we just want to hear the truth. Will you please just tell it like it is? So we strive to do that around here. So when they ask me, well, pastor, what do we do? I'm, I'm, I'm Christian. We're Christians, but we're living together. We're not yet married. What do we do? And the answer is simple. I say to them something like this. Well, do you want your life to please God? And of course they nod. Yeah, yeah, I do then choose to please him by either getting married or by separating, but don't continue to live in a way that goes against what you say you believe. Practice it. And that decision to get married or separate, is, it's part of this process of being sanctified and changed by the Holy Spirit working with his word. We all go through choices. It may not be that choice, but we all go through choices in our life. Am I going to live this way or am I going to live that? Our last series it was called Raising the Bar this summer, and it challenged many of us to, hey, I need to get real and I need to get serious with God about some things. And some of you have changed. For example, some of you have begun to change the way you talk. Some of you have determined to fight for the life of your marriage. Some have fought forgiveness uh, of, of things uh, that maybe you wronged with other people, and, and, uh, and, and some have determined to fight to save uh, you know, other things in your life. And, and so some of the changes the Holy Spirit makes in our lives over time take time. They're gradual. But what we discover with this prayer of Paul's today is that prayer plays a big part in our lives being changed. In our sanctification, prayer is part of it. And the kind of prayer that I'm talking about today that Paul prays today is asking God to help you and me and help our brothers and sisters in Christ to become the women and men that he wants us to be. And by praying, we're saying to God, here's what we're saying to him when we pray these prayers. God, I can't do this on my own. You don't have to raise your hand, but are there things in your life right now that you wish were changed and you know I cannot do this in my own strength? Of course there are. I can't do this on my own. So God, I'm asking you to do this for me. I'm asking you to do this for us. This morning, let's look at Paul's prayer for the, for the church, the people in the city of Ephesus, here in Ephesus chapter 1. That Paul prays for these things that we're going to look at in a moment. He prays for these things to happen in the believer's lives, by the way, tells me something in your notes. It tells me that we can't take change for granted. Don't take it for granted. Just say, well, if it happens, it happens. Paul prays for these things to happen. Just the fact that Paul is praying for these things in the lives of the church tells us this. Prayer changes things, doesn't it? Otherwise, why do we pray? Prayer changes things. You might jot this down if you're taking notes. This might have been a better point that that we grasp a little bit. But the Christian life is not lived on cruise control. We have to sometimes step on the gas. We have to sometimes step on the brake. Right? It's not lived on cruise control. I can't grow and become faithfully what the Lord intends in my life, hear me Christian, by simply attending a church service every Sunday or even every so often. That doesn't bring it about. If I sleep with my Bible under my pillow at night, it doesn't seep through the pillow into my brain. That doesn't work. So, in your notes, the church needs to pray for and encourage one another to be constantly changing. Right? Here's the kind of prayers we should be praying. 
constantly changing. So here's some things that make for a deeper prayer life. Number one, we need both the practical and the supernatural. And by the way, they both come from God. We need both the practical and the supernatural. Both come from God. Here's what Paul says in this prayer. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Here's what he's praying. Here's what he's saying there. You cannot mature and you cannot become Christ-like in your own strength. It takes prayer. It takes God working in your life. Holiness in our lives comes from the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Did you get that? Holiness comes from the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And Paul starts with two things that we must gain from the Spirit. Those two things are wisdom, he says, and revelation. Wisdom, what is that? Wisdom turns knowledge into life practice. It's not just knowing, it's taking that knowledge and turning it into behavior, turning it into what we do and how we think. Someone who has lots of knowledge but never seeks wisdom, and there are a lot of people like that. They know the Bible backwards and forwards, but they have no wisdom. They'll become, if you do that, if all you do when you study the Bible is seek knowledge, you become a spiritual egghead. You know, you'll have all this, you'll become, you know, blown up in your brain with all the knowledge you have, but it never gets into your life. You become so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. The Bible tells us to seek wisdom. Proverbs chapter four, verse seven. Where do we get wisdom from? Well, one place we get it from is here. Wisdom is supreme. So get wisdom and whatever else you get, get understanding. Understand what you've learned and put it to uh application in your life. And then where does it come from? Wisdom comes, Job wrote, comes with years and experience. Wisdom is found with the elderly. And understanding comes with long life. There's nothing wiser that you young people can do is that when you come to needing to make a decision in life is to seek seek out somebody with gray hair or like Jim, no hair, but seek out somebody you know, either hairs turn gray or it's turn loose, one or the other, you know, but seek out, out the, those folks. That's what the Bible says. It comes with age. It comes with long life. Why? Because people who have lived long lives have lived life. And they've made some mistakes. And they'll be glad to share those with you because why should I make the same mistakes my dad made, my granddad made? Why? I mean, they made enough mistakes for me, I shouldn't make the same ones. Wisdom comes with age. Listen to the, those with long life. And then the Bible tells us wisdom belongs to God who loves to share it with us. It comes from God. Now, James says, verse 5, chapter 1, now if any of you lacks wisdom. I, I can't tell you how many times I, I conversation last week, things people put on Facebook. I'm trying to decide, should I stay or should I go? Sounds like a good title for a song, doesn't it? Should I stay or should I go? What, what am I supposed to do? They're, they were asking for wisdom. And I saw one young man said, I'm going to listen to the older guys who've been here for a while. And because a lot of people, man, they don't listen to the older guys who've lived here for a while. They listen to people like Jim Cantori. Now, sometimes they're telling us good stuff. I don't don't want to launch into the media, but anyway. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Just go to God. And he says he gives to all, gives us all wisdom generously and without criticizing. He doesn't say, it's about time you asked me that. He doesn't say, well, that's a dumb question, Rick. Without criticizing, And it will be given to him. If you ask God for it, he blesses you with wisdom. Now, he may say to you, it may be a thing that he sends you to somebody older that's been through a life experience that you're about to have that can help you through it. That's wisdom. That's the spiritual. But then there's uh, the other part of this, too. There's the, 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 or that's the practical. There's the spiritual. That's understanding. Revelation is discovering the wonders of God's word. That's revelation. What does revelation mean? I'm figuring God's word out. He's explaining it to me. He's showing me what it means. It's those aha moments that come from being open to the scripture. We spend time in the scripture and the Holy Spirit says, here's what that means. 
And those are fun times, by the way, if you've never had those times, to read something. And maybe you've read it a hundred times before, and all of a sudden you read it and go, oh, that's what it means. That's a great moment in your life. Those are supernatural moments in our lives. Revelation is finding out something from studying the Bible, from praying, from open, being open to God's spirit through his word, and he reveals something to you that is new and maybe life-changing. It isn't discovering something that nobody ever knew before. I don't know that there's much in the Bible that after thousands of years of scriptures, somebody hasn't figured out. But there might be some things. But you say, this is new to me. The hope for this kind of revelation is why we believe that a worship service like this should be as distraction-free as possible. It's one reason why we invest so much in having the best nursery and kids' ministry possible on Sunday mornings. Why is that? It's so that if you're in here, you can focus on what the Lord is saying in this hour, in this room, through his word. It's why our connection groups are so important to our goal of becoming fully devoted disciples. And hopefully, you and I are being transformed as the Lord reveals his word to us. Secondly, Paul prays for our hearts to be enlightened. And by that he prays for that means that darkness surrounds us. He wouldn't pray for enlightenment if there wasn't such a thing as darkness, would he? I pray, Paul said, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. We used to sing a song, a little chorus, praise chorus song that said, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Guess what? We're not in heaven yet. Figure that one out. <laughs> we're not in heaven. We're, we're, we're not in heaven in here, although you may say, man, that was like being in heaven. Well, maybe a little bit. Hopefully it's kind of getting us ready for the worship that's going to be there around the throne of God, but we're not there yet. We're not living in his kingdom yet. So we live in this world influenced by a godless culture that's all around us, controlled by the, by the view of life that the culture in this world has in ways that contradict God and his world and, and his word. And, and it's dark in this world. And without the light that he gives to shine on our steps, as the psalmist said, you know, it's, light to my path, to my steps. It's dark. Uh, without that, we, we don't view life as God wants us to in his word. It's dark. Paul writes to the Ephesians, the same church at the end of the book in chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. He says, here's what you got to do, Christians. You got to put on the full armor of God, not just the parts you like. Put it all on so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil because our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So what does enlightened mean? Enlightened means that our worldview, that worldview means how we see things in the big picture, that our worldview needs to always be sharpened by asking this question. I hope you ask this question often. Okay, then, but what does God say about this? What does God say about this? Enlightened means we are changing who we allow to influence how we think. The Bible talks about the importance of our mind, doesn't it? And our mind being transformed, Romans chapter 12. Verse 1, this doesn't necessarily happen in your life or mine overnight. I've had three children. One of the things I discovered about newborn babies is that their vision is very poor. When they're first born, you ever look at a newborn baby, you know, and it's kind of like they can't really see you. You know, they're, they're trying their best to focus, but they can't. They're only able to focus when they're newborn on things that are 10 to 12 inches away. Anything that's farther than that, it's all fuzzy, blurry. But over time, as the brain develops, the eyes develop, they begin to see clearly. They begin to see right side up. They begin to see uh, in color. And so, so Paul is saying this enlightenment, opening our, uh, the eyes of our hearts, th this enlightenment means we should pray for each other that we can have clear spiritual vision as we grow and live in a world full of darkness and moral cultural fog. Do you pray that for one another? 
Number three, we pray for the hope of his calling so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Now, who doesn't need hope? Everybody does. Some more than others, but everyone needs hope. It's the promise. What is the hope of his calling? It's the promise of everlasting life. That's the hope of his calling. Why then do we need to pray for one another to know that hope? There's a really good chance that in a room like with this many people in here this morning, there's a really good chance that there is someone this morning who is struggling with doubt. And maybe that's why you came to church this morning, struggling with doubt. You, you may know that you have received Christ as your Savior, and you probably know that he's made a promise that belief in him guarantees you eternal life, but you're doubting. John 5, 24. Read that with me. Let's read it together. This is a great promise. I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has an eternal life and will not come under judgment, but is passed from death unto life. I promise you, you have eternal life. But for some reason, maybe you're here today and you're having doubts. Maybe it's because you've done something committed some kind of a sinful act or you're in a habit, whatever it might be, that in your mind is so bad that certainly God can't even keep his promise for you. Maybe your spiritual life has been stuck in neutral for a long time and you just feel like I've lost all connection with God. It's kind of like I'm, I'm afraid to pray because I'm afraid if I say, dear heavenly father, he might stop me and say, and who are you? Maybe you feel like you've lost your connection with him. Maybe someone has even said to you, I'm not going to ask you if anybody said this, but maybe someone has said to you because of things that you do in life, how you practice your life, they, they stop you and say, you know what? I really can't imagine that you're a real Christian. That'll cause doubt, won't it? Maybe some difficult circumstances have happened in your life and you feel abandoned by God and wonder if his, he's real. I'm trying to put my mind and trying to figure out, the, and the Bahamas is an incredibly Christian nation, if you didn't know. I mean, there are stronger Christians as a nation down there, certainly than we are in the United States. But I wonder if I was on the island of Abaco or Freeport, those places that just got wiped out and I survived, I wonder if I wouldn't say, you see, all these years I've been believing in God and look what God does to me. I don't know that he's real. I don't know that he cares. Maybe some difficult things have happened in your life and you feel abandoned by God and you wonder if he's real and your hope is dwindling. Well, like Paul, we need somebody. Like the Baham- you know what they need from us? Not just our, our finances, not just our resources, not just our help. They need our prayers because there's many of them right now that are doubting. We need somebody praying for us that the hope that we have in Christ doesn't fade, that we don't fall through the cracks, that we don't walk away because we've lost hope. Pray, Paul says, I'm praying for your hope. And we don't have to necessarily know what might be going on in another person's heart that might cause that hope to disappear. It's not that I know somebody that needs hope. Pray for me, would you? That that I'll discover the hope of his calling, that I won't lose hope. Oh, not you, Rick, you're a pastor. You never lose hope. You never doubt. Oh, would you like to come live in my brain for a while? <laughs> Just pray for others that the hope will be strong. Then Paul says, pray for our part in his kingdom to be glorious. He says, I pray that you may know what are the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints. We have said a lot, especially in our last series, raising the bar about reward and the position that's available to us as Christians in Christ's coming kingdom. And some of us will be rewarded greatly for our service and devotion to him in this part of life. Some of us will get little at the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe even nothing, Paul says, because the things of the world kept us from pursuing Christ with all our hearts. God's desire is for all of us to get big time rewards at his judgment seat when he hands them out. That's God's desire for you. God's desire is to load you up 
God's desire is when he sees you coming to his judgment seat, he already knows what, what he's going to give to you. And it's like he, he calls to the angels and he says, okay, load up the dump trucks. Bring them here. We're going to dump all the uh, incredible reward for this Christian. He wants all of heaven to celebrate the lives that you and I live in this life. So we pray for one another. We pray for one another that we will live for him now so that we'll be rewarded in a glorious way then. And that's eternal praying, isn't it? That's not just praying for here right now, these things that I'm experiencing at this moment. This is praying for one another in the kingdom. He wants you and me to pray for one another that way. When was the last time I prayed for somebody to be glorious, gloriously rewarded in the kingdom? When was the last time you prayed for somebody that way? I'm hoping for big things for you in the kingdom to come. And then number five, prayer, we, we need to be praying for his vast and immeasurable power and strength for life right now. Don't just pray for things in the kingdom, but it's good to pray for things right now. But the things that we pray for right now are things that are temporal so often. Pray for his vast and immeasurable power and strength. Paul says, and what is the, the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength? You know, when I think of something immeasurable and great, I think of the Grand Canyon. Have you ever been there? Oh my. You stand on one side of it and you look across and you cannot, you cannot imagine how far is that because it looks like I can reach out and touch it, but I can tell it's got to be miles across. And you get to the edge where there's a railing, I hope, and you look down and you go, man, that's deep. It's vast. It's as far as I can see. That's a picture that Gail and I took when we were there. Snow, by the way, on the front. And those people, I don't know how far they apart. They weren't very far, but way on the other side. It's the other side of the canyon. To me, when I think of vast and immeasurable, I think of that. You can't put that vastness into words. And that was Paul's meaning here as we pray for the immeasurable greatness and the vastness of his strength. He was praying that, you know what? He was saying it's impossible to measure it by any dimension. Next week, I believe it is we're going to talk about some dimensions, four-dimensional things that Paul speaks of. It's overwhelming power and strength for this life right now. We cannot describe it. We can't put it into words. How often when we see someone struggling for life and to live life for the Lord, and we see them falling away, how often, Christian, do we fail to reach out? Do we fail to pray for him or her that they would know God's power, that they would know God's strength, and before, listen to me, before we do anything for people, you know what I think we should do? Before we do anything, we should pray this for one another. God, may they know your immeasurable, vast power and strength. Before we try and tackle the struggle, pray for the strength. Before we try and solve the problem, pray for them to see God's power. And we need to do that because whatever somebody's problem, you know, I've discovered this after a bunch of years in ministry. I can't fix you. I've tried to fix a whole bunch of you. I can't fix, I can't fix me. But there's nothing that God can't fix. And so if we start with prayer, we can be in on what God can do. Remember this video, this TV commercial? This was on a bunch of years ago, but some of you don't remember this. Pay me now or pay me later. Now, we know that guy's an actor, not a real mechanic. I just realized this. He's got that brand new oil filter sitting down on a bunch of greasy dirt on the garage floor that he's about to put on that car. So that guy doesn't know anything about changing oil. He'd have it upside down at least, wouldn't he, Steve? And I like that. But he's, what is he talking about? You, you, have you heard the term? I think Volkswagen invented this term, preventive maintenance. And if you've ever had a Volkswagen, that's a good thing to know. My first car was a Volkswagen. <laughs> seems as though we're quick, preventive maintenance in the spiritual life, it seems as though we're quick to pray for things that are broken. And it could be things at home. How many of you had to pray for your generator? <laughs> you know, we pray for things that are broken and need to be rebuilt. 
rather than praying for the spiritual growth and transformation that would prevent some things in our lives from taking place. We wait until it's busted. Sadly, it seems as though those of us who are in trouble in our relationships, in our finances, in our commitment to Christ, it seems as though we'll wait until the water is over the bridge, until the dam breaks before we reach out to help for help. We'll get the call at church. Pastors will get the call. Our counseling team will get the call. And and we'll hear this from people. It's too late to save it. It's too late to fix it. And I want to say to them, why did you wait until it was too late? Why? Paul knew these Ephesians that he's writing to, these people there in Asia Minor. He knew they weren't perfect. He knew they struggled with temptation persecution. He knew they struggled with spiritual laziness like all Christians do. How how did he know that? Because he spent a lot of time with these folks. So he prays this prayer of preventive spiritual maintenance for them before they fall between the cracks. And so this kind of prayer means this. It means we're praying proactively, not just reactively. And let's be honest, most of my prayers Most of your prayers, I bet, are reactive prayers. We hear about somebody's tragedy. We hear about somebody falling away. We hear about this and that going on. And then we begin to pray for them. Rather than before it ever happens, we just are praying these kinds of things for one another. There's prayer. There's prayer because we care. That's why we pray. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time you prayed like Paul? in this prayer for somebody else. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength. When was the last time you prayed something like that for somebody? Let's say I'll take a moment right now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And maybe with those words that are there in your outline, they're in your scriptures, maybe just take a moment and do just that. Pray for this church that we, as Paul pray for the Ephesians, that we might experience these things. You may know somebody who's battling with self, someone's battling with temptation. You may know someone whose marriage is falling apart. You may know someone, maybe your own, with a wayward child. Let's right now pray these things that Paul prayed for and over them.